before Perth. All right, so okay, great. Let's do this thing if that's okay with you. All right. Uh... Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Endocrine Grand Rounds. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our very own Dr. Bradley Thrasher. Um, uh, Brad uh, uh, graduated from uh, his pediatric residency uh, from Wake Forest in 2014, um, his fellowship at UNC Chapel Hill in 2017. Uh, he did go on to um, uh, uh, go through the rigors and received his MBA actually in 2021. And in the intervening time, he worked in the Division of Endocrinology at Earl Langer in Tennessee until 2019, um, at which point he joined our division as an assistant professor at the University of Louisville. Um, Dr. Thrasher is the director of the Christensen Family Sports and Activity Program here at the Wendy Novak Diabetes Center. And this includes coordination of diabetes clinical education and research activities with our exercise physiologist, Tim McKay, our sports educator, Eric Davenport, and actually our entire clinical and research team at, at the Diabetes Center. And so today, Dr. Thrasher will be speaking on this very topic with his presentation. As you can see, type one diabetes and exercise, it's a workout. All right, please welcome Dr. Thrasher. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wintergers. And before I get going, you mentioned Tennessee, and I will throw out there that uh, Tennessee had a nice win last night for those people that like blue. So, yes, uh, they did. I'll, I'll, I'll let it. I'll let it be at that. Tennessee's terrible at a lot of things right now, but that was a a little victory. Uh, so, anyways, well, guys, again, I'm Brad Thrasher. I'm one of the pediatric endocrinologists on staff, uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be able to to speak with you all today. I'm going to try to be brief and keep this under three hours because this is a, a big topic. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of challenges uh, that those living with diabetes face when it comes to exercise uh, and activity. So, we're going to discuss some of those challenges and then hopefully some potential solutions to offer your uh, patients so they can hopefully have a better quality of life and, and enjoy exercise more. So, uh, I have no conflict of interest to disclose. Before we get into the uh, the meat uh, of the discussion, I always find history kind of fun. So when I was putting together this topic, of course, I'm going through PubMed and you know my filter search searches, you know type one diabetes, activity, exercise, all that kind of stuff. And I like reading papers from kind of yesteryear to kind of see where we've come. So the the quote that you see on the screen uh, is from a paper written in 1979, and the title of the paper was the role of physical exercise and training and management of diabetes mellitus. Uh, and the quote specifically states, in juvenile uh, type diabetes, physical activity can be used as an efficient therapeutic adjunct only in cooperative, well-instructed patients. Uh, and I kind of chuckle at that, you know, a little over 40 years later, uh, because now we know that diabetes uh, is an essential component to care, or excuse me, we know that exercise is an essential component uh, in care of those living uh, with diabetes. Uh, in fact, the American Diabetes Association recommends that uh, youth uh, engage in 60 minutes a day of physical activity and adults engage in 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise. Uh, so again, you know, we've come a long ways uh, in 40 years. And then I hope this is perfect. So the uh, this little bar graph is also from PubMed when I was doing my my search is when this is particular filter for this graph is uh, type 1 diabetes and uh, activity. And basically what you see here is that the, most of the research in this field has been done in the last kind of three decades. Um, the first paper I found was actually published in like 1942 and then there was nothing again until 48 uh, and uh, et cetera. So we've learned a lot uh, in the last several decades, but there's still a lot to learn uh, because, again, this is still uh, a challenge. So, as previously mentioned, uh, exercise is considered an essential component of diabetes cares as it has significant metabolic uh, effects. And those living with diabetes, exercise helps maintain a healthy weight, lowers cholesterol, relieves tension, stress, improves mood. Uh, we know that it ultimately improve, uh, improves glycemic uh, control as well. However, I want to say the main barrier to exercise in most people living with type 1 is hypoglycemia or even fear uh, of hypoglycemia. Both exercise uh, and insulin promote movement of glucose from blood to muscle. They oppose each other's effects on fuel mobilization, 
from tissue stores and blood. Uh, physiological increase in insulin can abolish exercise-induced increases in hepatic glucose output uh, and lipolysis. Those living with diabetes often find themselves with a relative state of being in hyperinsulinemia, uh, hyperinsulinemia uh, if they do not make provisions for exercise. Um, and so, therefore, they're at risk for hypoglycemia. And even if they make, oops, sorry, even if they make uh, provisions, they're still at greater risk compared to the uh, general population. So, to kind of better understand the relationship between exercise and insulin, I'm going to take us all back to, to biochemistry uh, for just kind of a quick review on metabolism. So, metabolism is defined as the total of all energy transformation that occurs in the body. When exercising, in particular, energy is needed to support muscle activity. In providing this needed energy, our body is subject to the first law of thermodynamics. Yes, this talk has the first law of thermodynamics in it today. Wasn't expecting that, I know. But that law, remember, states that uh, energy is neither created nor destroyed, uh, but can only change form. So this diagram that you see here is pretty much depicting our first law of thermodynamics. So we have um, energy, which comes from our fuel, uh, food, our fuel, our macronutrients, our carbohydrates, our fat, uh, and our protein. This, um, they all can be used as fuels. The chemical energy produced from the food fuel is stored as adenosine triphosphate, so ATP. The ATP then transfers its energy to energy requiring physiological functions, such as um, muscle contractions during exercise, in which some energy um, is performs the work and then some energy is converted to heat. Thus, ATP is stored chemical energy that links the energy yielding and the energy requiring functions within the cell. So just a brief review there and then bear with me just kind of a brief review on cellular respiration as well. So now that we've done all that, let's just cellular respiration. Here we go. Cellular respiration is the process by which cell transfers energy from food to ATP and a stepwise series of reactions. All the macronutrients, the carbohydrate, the fat, the protein, all can serve as substrate for the production of ATP. Of these three substrates, though, carbohydrate uh, is the preferred substrate for our body. Carbohydrate metabolism is important as, again, uh, carbohydrate is the only nutrient that can be used to produce energy anaerobically, so without oxygen. Uh, and additionally, carbohydrate is the preferred fuel for the body because it requires less oxygen in order to be metabolized uh, when compared to, to fats. Uh, carbohydrate metabolism consists of four steps, uh, which ultimately results uh, in the production of 30 plus molecules of ATP. So we reviewed our body once run on carbohydrate glucose, uh, but how do we get that uh, fuel into our cells? You all know the answer to this, it is insulin. So the predominant, um, transporters of glucose in human skeletal, cardiac muscle, and adipose cells are GLUT1, um, which tend to be, or which are non-insulin regulated, and GLUT4, which are insulin regulated transporters. In the resting muscle, when glucose levels are relatively stable, glucose enters by the non-insulin regulated GLUT1 transporters. Following a meal, insulin uh, following a meal, we get the, the rise in glucose, the GLUT1 receptors kind of downregulate, and then insulin binds to its receptors to upregulate GLUT4, and it does this through a cascade of second messengers. Um, so basically, through the second messenger system, uh, the GLUT4 translocates from their storage vesicles within the cell to the sarcolemma. They're so serving as a transporter for glucose into our cell. During exercise and early recovery, however, muscle contraction uh, involves calcium release, which also stimulates uh, the translocation of GLUT4. So the GLUT4 transporters are thus activated both by insulin through the second messenger system and by muscle contraction. Um, so GLUT4 transporters, again, exist intracellularly in small vesicles within the cytoplasm. When activated, they move to the cell surface and serve as portal through which glucose enters the cell. The dual stimulation of GLUT4 translocation by insulin and muscle contraction is important because insulin secretion is suppressed during exercise. Thus, during exercise, the predominant activator of GLUT4 transporters is the muscle contraction itself. 
So just kind of reviewing glucose homeostasis in those living without diabetes. Moderate um, intensity exercise leads to a marked increase in muscle glucose uptake. Despite the increased rate of glucose removal from the body, healthy individuals do not become hypoglycemic. Arterial blood glucose uh, levels change uh, very little, in fact, during moderate exercise because the sum of the increments in hepatic glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis match the increment of the muscle uptake of glucose. The importance of the close tracking of glucose use by hepatic glucose production is illustrated in these figures. So here in the top figure, we start to exercise. Our glucose uptake increases within our cells. Our body starts to re release more glucose from liver, muscle, et cetera and our blood sugars stay relatively stable during uh, the event. Of note, glucose may rise uh, by three milligrams per kilogram per minute uh, in response to moderate intensity exercise. And if the liver did not respond to exercise, blood glucose would decrease at a rate of approximately one and a half milligrams per deciliter every minute. So theoretically, overt hypoglycemia would be present in about 30 minutes. That's kind of what they're showing here in these diagrams is you have impaired glucose release and your blood glucose starts to decline over time. Also interestingly, during high intensity exercise, the increase in glucose released by the liver uh, may even exceed the increase in muscle glucose uh, uptake itself. So you might uh, go above kind of your target blood sugar range during that time. And then there are two conditions when the liver can fail and hypoglycemia can result. So prolonged exercise, typically greater uh, than two hours or more, can lead to hypoglycemia, even otherwise healthy uh, post-absorptive subjects because hepatic glycogen stores deplete themselves and um, gluconeogenesis isn't enough to keep up with the, the glucose uptake. And then the other um, reason as to why hypoglycemia can occur is those who have diabetes that are on insulin. Um, when we have that mixed match of insulin, the insulin will um, block the hepatic response of uh, glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis, uh, thus leading to hypoglycemia. I put this slide in there to show that there are many variables that impact glucose homeostasis uh, when exercising. You know, a lot of times we want to think about, you know, reduce your insulin, let's eat more, but, you know, not only does the, the type of exercise, but the duration of the, the activity impacts glucose control. Um, high intensity act activities cause a greater release of counter-regulatory hormones like epinephrine and glucagon, which can cause immediate and lasting elevations uh, in blood glucose levels. Um, in fact, an all-out sprint as short as 10 seconds uh, can have a lasting effect on glycemic balance for up to, to two hours. Uh, we'll show that here in a minute. Um, duration also has an impact with the longer periods of exercise generally resulting in greater blood glucose use and the risk uh, of hypoglycemia increases. Exercising more than once in a day or more than one day in a row also impacts blood glucose outcomes during the exercise itself and afterwards. Uh, the impact of physical activity is also complicated by the nature of the sport, where you have periods of uh, intense activity or interspersed with periods of much uh, less activity, such as in football. If you're on defense, you're going to be giving your all until the offense comes in, and you're just kind of resting on the sidelines. So again, you know, individuals with type 1 diabetes are in, uh, frequently unable to adequately alter endogenous insulin levels uh, and experience normal hormonal glucose counterregulation during and following exercise. Consequently, they're at risk for early and late hypoglycemia and may even develop hyperglycemia depending on the type of activity they're doing. Um, the risk of overnight and next day hypoglycemia is particularly problematic if moderate to vigorous exercise uh, is undertaken in the afternoon or early evening. Late onset hypoglycemia following exercise increases uh, with the duration of exercise and the fitness of the individual doing the exercise. Uh, and activities lasting 90 to 120 minutes double the risk of hypoglycemia in adolescents and young adults. So now we're going to, moving forward, we're going to look at several studies um, that have looked at the different effects of exercise on glucose control. 
So this study was published by Yardley and colleagues in 2013. And again, it was just to look at the effects of different types of exercise, aerobic versus resistant exercise on uh, individuals. They recruited 12 non-obese individuals with type one. They had 10 male, two females. Uh, their ages were 17 to 62 years of age. I'm gonna say they had relatively good control. Their A1C was 7.1. They would have participants arrive at their uh, facility uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon, the day after they changed their CGM. And then they would put them in two arms. So the aerobic arm was they would run on a treadmill for 45 minutes at 60% of their VO2 max. The resistance arm was that they would do um, three sets of eight repeti repetitions for seven different exercises, and they would get 90 second breaks between the sets, and that would last for a total of 45 minutes. And then the control group was just these individuals came back and got to just rest for 45 minutes, hang out, watch TV. Participants were instructed to make insulin changes. So those that were on MDI would reduce their basal rate by 10% the day before uh, the activity. If they were on a pump, they would reduce the, their basal rate by 50% one hour um, before the start of exercise, and they would leave that reduction until the exercise was complete. Um, the researchers would, of course, make them check their blood sugars. If the blood sugar was less than 90, those on a pump would reduce by another 25% their basal rate, and then all individuals would eat a snack that consisted of 25 grams of carbohydrate before being able to uh, exercise. So what they found, what I could kind of show out here, again, your top line here is the control group. The short dashed line is the doing the aerobic exercise, and the darker dashed line, when we say with the diamonds in it, is the resistance exercise arm. So resistance exercise resulted in much smaller declines in blood glucose during exercise when compared to aerobic exercise. Resistance exercise was also associated with relatively stable early post-exercise blood glucose concentrations. And, that less, and they also found that less carbohydrate supplementation was required during a resist, resistance exercise versus aerobic uh, exercise. The mechanisms for the more dramatic reduction in blood glucose levels during aerobic versus resistance exercise, you know, they said were unclear to, to them. You know, they postulated that the attenuated declines in blood glucose concentration may be related to uh, increase in your counter-regulatory hormones, uh, epinephrine, glucagon, et cetera. They didn't measure these hormones. Uh, they also postulated that the increase in lactate during the resistance exercises could have potentially resulted in the attenuated declines uh, as lactate can stimulate glucose uh, neogenesis. Um, so I'll say that that's an interesting thought to us and one of my colleagues, uh, Tim McKay, and I have uh, worked, we're currently working on an IRB to look at doing resistance exercise in youth living with type one uh, and monitoring kind of lactate and glucose levels on them to see if there's a good correlation there. So more to come on that in the future. Uh, but overall, this study showed there was no significant differences uh, among the conditions with respect to any measures of hypoglycemia or nocturnal hypoglycemia between the two arms of resistance and um, aerobic exercises. Yardley and colleagues like to do uh, research in this field, and here's another um, study that was published by them in 2012. And it was pretty much the exact same cohort of individuals um, but here they wanted to look to see the effects of exercise order on acute glycemic response uh, in the individuals living with type 1 diabetes. Uh, both e either they were having to either do aerobic exercise followed by resistance exercise or vice versa, resistance followed by aerobic within the same session. So again here, the dark line is when we have resistance uh, exercise followed by aerobic and the dashed line is aerobic followed by resistance. So they pretty much had a lot of the same uh, requirements for participants. They would show up at four o'clock in the afternoon uh, in their facility. Um, and then they did make uh, here though, they put five days between the two groups. So depending on how they wanted to flip flop them. 
And again, for the aerobic exercise, it was running on a treadmill for 45 minutes, 60% uh, of their VO2 max. Uh, and then for the resistance exercise, here it was three sets of eight repetitions um, with 90 seconds of rest between sets. So pretty much identical to the, the other, other study. Um, and kind of what they found was that performing resistance exercise before aerobic exercise rather than the reverse resulted in attenuated declines in glucose concentration during exercise, fewer exercise induced hypoglycemic events, and again, less need for carbohydrate suppl supplementation. Furthermore, they observed beneficial effects from this sequence on subsequent 12-hour glycemic trends where the duration and severity of hypoglycemia was reduced. Um, so they postulate that the benefits of performing resistance exercise before aerobic exercise instead of the reverse uh, were observed despite overall energy expenditures being equal between the experimental sessions. Again, they felt like this was just the resistance exercise allows for the counter-regulatory hormones, norepinephrine, uh, epinephrine, et cetera, which allowed for this kind of more stable stability in blood glucose. The bottom uh, figure here represents uh, continuous glucose monitoring of interstitial glucose values from one hour after exercise until 12 hours after exercise. The dashed line is our aerobic exercise cohort, and the, the solid line is our resistant exercise cohort. And overall, though, they concluded that the frequency of nocturnal hypoglycemia events did not differ between the two exercise sessions. However, the duration and depth of hypoglycemia tended to be longer and more severe uh, in those that did aerobic resistance first uh, rather than after resistance exercise. So this study was published in 2015 by Turner and colleagues, uh, and it sought to examine the glycemic and glucoregulatory responses to resistant exercise sessions of different volumes in those living with type 1. So they recruited eight individuals, seven males, one female, and these were all adults, average age was 38, had overall okay uh, glucose control, their average A1C was 8.7, and they would have these individuals come to their facility first thing in the morning, not allowed to eat breakfast, but they made no changes in their basal insulin um, requirements. And they would just do resistant training programs. So they would do a one set, which lasted 14 minutes, two sets, which was up to 28 minutes, or three sets, a 42 minute exercise program, or they got to rest, which is the con that you see in this graph here. Um, and then they would take the blood samples before and after uh, exercise, looking at what their glucose levels were doing. So kind of what they showed was that blood glucose levels progressively rose after one and two sets of resistant exercises. However, inclusion of a third set attenuated the exercise-induced hyperglycemia and returned the blood glucose to that of a non-exercise trial. So here, just on the graph, we have our first set, our second set, blood glucose levels rising over time, but then our third set, we start to decline. Uh, we never reach the same peak, and we decline at the 30-minute mark. And then when we rest, blood sugars remain relatively stable. So they felt like the novel finding from their study was that this additional or this third set of resistant exercises attenuated the exercise-induced uh, hyperglycemic response that was seen with other resistant exercise training programs. This was a cool study because they did look at counter-regulatory hormones, adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, et cetera. You know, and they postulated that, you know, they expected the rise uh, in blood glucoses to be due to an increase in these counter-regulatory hormones. But they were quick to point out that uh, adrenaline, you know, was highest after the, the third set. Um, of the exercise, so they said, you know, this is kind of a, a paradoxical uh, effect that we're seeing here. So kind of what they concluded was they, um, that they fit that adding the third set somehow increased glucose uptake within the muscle, which allowed for the more stabilization um, of BGs over time. Again, just their postulation.
So this was a, I think I thought it kind of just a nice diagram that was published by Riddle and Associates back in 2017 to kind of go over what we showed. So aerobic exercise has been shown, we know it's going to decrease. So, you know, if you're jogging, biking, inline skating, you know, you can expect your, your BGs to go down. If you're doing more resistance and aerobic exercises, uh, we're going to expect blood sugars to, to rise. You know, again, though, he did do a nice job, I think, of pointing out there's a lot of variables that go into this again. Fitness level, the duration, the intensity, uh, how much insulin on board, all that uh, can affect these. And I feel like what a lot of our athletes do, especially in the, the pediatric world, is probably a, a mixed picture of where we're doing both aerobic and anaerobic exercises at the same time. So, again, you can get kind of a mix uh, in your blood glucose response depending on what you're doing more of. So even though our knowledge of exercise impact on those living with diabetes has in, uh, increased over time, uh, the guidelines around uh, exercise and diabetes are still vague. So this is from Diabetes Care in 2021, and there's good information here, you know, to keep people safe. You know, have a blood sugar of 90 to 250 before you start uh, exercise. But then they get really vague in the sense of reduce basal insulin doses, increase your carbohydrate intake, you know, eat bedtime snacks, uh, reduce uh, mealtime insulin before activity. So there's really no good specific information here, just kind of vague, uh, if you will. But I'll say that we've had other colleagues in the field who have done a great job writing um, some guidelines. So again, this is by Riddle uh, and colleagues, published in 17 in The Lancet, and they did a remarkable job when it comes to just your carbohydrates, insulin changes, and stuff like uh, of that nature. And I've recommended uh, this paper actually patients to, to read uh, and the guidelines that he's uh, posted, I, I typically go by them. That's too hard to read uh, on the screen. So kind of summarizing it, basically the uh, riddle was saying that when we're going to be exercising, we should try to eat about one gram of carbohydrate per kilogram but this needs to be tailored according to the, the exercise, the intensity, and the type, just a starting point uh, to start with. If your blood glucose is less than 90 uh, milligrams per deciliter before exercise, eat a 10 to 20 gram carb snack uh, to bring it up. If your exercise is 30 minutes or less, no additional fuel is needed as long as your blood glucose is, you know, remain above 90 milligrams per deciliter. If an individual is exercising 30 to 60 minutes, small amounts of carbohydrate should be considered uh, to, to consume them during the, the event. So he recommends 10 to 15 grams during that 30 to 60 minutes uh, will likely enhance performance. If exercise is 60 minutes to 150 minutes, increase your carbohydrate intake to about 30 to 60 grams uh, per hour. And if your exercise is greater than 150 minutes, probably should consume 60 to 90 grams of carbohydrate uh, to keep yourself safe and to uh, increase performance. And I think this is good advice, not only for those living with diabetes, but even without, uh, I'll share that I've got into more running during the, the pandemic, and I have found that if I will take the time to eat like a runner's gel pack when I've been going for about 45 minutes, my uh, performance has improved. So we got to refuel ourselves. So a great job here talking about carbohydrate recommendations, but what about insulin recommendations? So when going through the literature, kind of one of the first papers that I could find that discussed this was back in 2001 by, uh, I'm probably going to mispronounce their name, but Robisaw, Lorhet, uh, and colleagues. And they did a, a great job looking at what insulin should be reduced if you're going to eat within 90 minutes uh, of exercise. So they kind of broke it down into intensity. So um, if you're working at 25% of your VO2 max, that's like going on a walk. 50% would be like a, a jog, and then 75% is like playing a, a game of basketball. You know, you're really, you're really working at it. And then the dose reduction of your short-acting insulin for 30 minutes should be 25, 50, and 75%. 60 minutes, cut it even more, 50 or 75%. And they really postulated that very few individuals can last 60 minutes or more uh, going at 75% of their, their VO2 max. 
And so their results showed a significant improvement in glycemic control, and here's their results. So these figures here, so figure A and figure B, the circles represent if there was no change to their insulin. They got 100% of their dose leading up to the event. The square in figure A is a 50% reduction uh, in insulin. So basically they would have the participants take their insulin, eat, and then exercise 90 minutes later. And what figure A is showing that with more insulin on board, you have, sorry, you have a greater decline in your blood glucose values compared to if you have less insulin on board. And then after the event is over, you tend to have higher blood sugars or blood glucose values after exercise. And then when they showed again in figure B, here the, the squares still represent a 50% reduction, but the triangles represent roughly they, a 75% reduction because they only gave them 25% of what their normal intake should have been. So again, they show that the less insulin you have on board going into the event, the higher your blood sugar is going to be, the less decline that occurs during exercise, and then we tend to rise uh, after the event of having less insulin on board. So this was at the 60 minute time frame. They also did their studies looking at 30 minutes of exercise, uh, pretty much showing the exact same things that the more insulin you have on board, the greater decline you're going to have because, again, this is no reduction versus a 50% reduction. And then here, again, 100% uh, versus taking 25% uh, of what you should, uh, what was normally called for. So they ultimately concluded that the less insulin one has on board before exercise leads to less risk of hypoglycemia. So going back to Riddle's study from 17, they pretty much copied forward the, the, the results in their paper. They broke it down, though, I think a little prettier because they talked mainly for aerobic exercise. We should be doing these reductions if we're doing uh, intense anaerobic uh, or uh, aerobic exercises, no reduction should be had. Uh, and I loved how they wrote uh, here, not assessed, since they felt like if you're really putting out, again, very few people can sustain 60 minutes of intense physical activity. So don't worry about that. Uh, that's pretty much what he's saying there. But um, they, again, you know, just, um, he didn't do any studies, this was just uh, published in his data. And when it comes to our, our sports clinic, these are the recommendations that we typically tell our, our kids to make when it comes to reducing if they're going to be eating within 90 minutes of uh, activity. So what about those uh, on pumps, you know, uh, because pumps allow us to adjust our, our basal rates. So um, this was a study from 2019 published by Zaharibia, uh, uh, I know I butchered that, I apologize, uh, and colleagues. And the goal of their study was to determine if the basal rate reduction set 90 minutes pre-exercise better attenuated hypoglycemia versus pump suspension at the onset of exercise. So they recruited 17 individuals and they had them complete three 60-minute treadmill exercises, just running at 50% of their VO2 max. And then again, their insulin strategies were either just a pump suspension, which is the, the circle dot right at the start of the exercise, a 50%, which is your triangle of basal rate set 90 minutes before exercise, or an 80% basal rate reduction 90 minutes before exercise. And what they found was that blood glucose levels at exercise onset was higher if you had a 50% reduction versus an 80% reduction. But by exercise in, the 80% reduction showed the smallest drop, uh, on average about 31 milligrams per deciliter uh, versus the others. The 50% basal rate reduction had a drop of about 50 milligrams per deciliter. And if the pump suspension was started just at the onset, it was about a 70 uh, a milligram per deciliter change uh, during the activity. They also showed that those that just did the pump suspension, seven out of 17 of the participants uh, developed hypo hypoglycemia versus only one out of the 17 
uh, developing hypoglycemia with the, the basal rate reductions. And then following their exercise, they all had to eat a standardized meal. They got a nice little lean cuisine from this group, uh, and then blood glucoses uh, would rise. Um, so they concluded that overall, a 50 to 80 percent basal rate reduction set 90 minutes before exercise improves glucose control uh, and decreases hypoglycemia risk uh, during exercise better than pump suspension at exercise onset while not compromising the post-exercise meal glucose control. This group also sought to evaluate for overnight hypoglycemia. So they had their participants uh, wear a CGM and they just monitored again interstitial glucoses overnight. So figure A represents these interstitial glucose readings from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, post-exercise across all conditions. And the interstitial glucose remained relatively stable overnight with no difference across any of the, the three arms, really. Um, the interstitial glucose levels on average were 131, 136, 140 milligrams per deciliter for the 80% reduction, 50% reduction, uh, and the pump suspension at the start of the onset. Figure B shows the mean percent time in euglycemia, which they defined as 70 to 180. That's the white part of the pie graph. Hyperglycemia, which was greater than 180, which is the, the black of the pie graph, or hypoglycemia, which is the gray of the pie graph, which was defined as less than 70. Uh, percent time in euglycemia was very comparable across all groups overnight. Uh, 83, 83, and 78% for the 80% reduction, 50% reduction, and pump suspension at start of onset. So they found there was no uh, statistical significance here. Uh, the percent time in hyperglycemia was also uh, very similar with no statistical significance found. Uh, and even though that the pump suspension was up to 5% compared to 1% and 2% in the other groups, they did not find a statistical significance here. And so, you know, technology is continuing to evolve. Now we have hybrid closed loops uh, on the market. Um, and one of their biggest challenges is trying, you know, a lot of people will have hypoglycemia on these loops because they are making just constant adjustments um, depending on eating you're having a rise before you go. So I'll say there's little literature out there on this right now. I think in the next few years we'll be seeing more and more, especially with Pod 5 coming on the market. But this was a study that was published at the end of 2020 by uh, Zaharvia and colleagues. And you can tell that for those just kind of on a standard open loop pump, a lot of recommendations. But for those on a closed loop pump, minimal recommendations. So basically their recommendations were to use the exercise target of the, this pump, they're, what they're referring to here is your, pretty much your tandem T-slim pump with control IQ. So to use the exercise target, and the exercise target in Control IQ just raises the ceiling of the where your targets are going to be. So typically with Control IQ, it's between 112, 160, no changes are made. But when you put in exercise mode, that 112 automatically turns into 140 uh, is where it's going to keep you at. And you got to remember too, Control IQ is predicting 30 minutes into the future. So even in exercise mode, if it predicts your blood sugar is going to be greater than 160, it'll increase basal rates. If it predicts greater than 180, it'll give you that 60% reduction or 60% uh, bolus of what you should receive. So they really cautioned uh, individuals not to eat, uh, or not to, not to, I should say, not to eat uncovered uh, carbs because putting the eating the food greater than 10 minutes and then going to exercise, the sensor will start to notice a rise in blood sugar. It will typically ramp up your basals and maybe giving you boluses, which will put more insulin on board and increase the risk for uh, hypoglycemia. So they said if you're, you want to eat, eat less than 10 minutes before you do your, your exercise. And they also said to run your exercise mode longer. They said, you know, one to two hours. Some people might need to run it all night long uh, to try to prevent hypoglycemia. And then another... Um, Thing, you know, another kind of thought to work through would be maybe to create a whole basal profile for exercise 
versus your non-exercise uh, day, like a sport day if you're participating in like a game day versus a non-game day, just so that you have different changes in your basal rates on game day versus non-game day, but that would take a lot more work. Um, if you read the kind of the dark webs when it comes to strategies for closed loop, people are trying all sorts of different things. Some people will do phantom boluses to trick the pump into thinking there's more insulin on board, uh, so that it's not going to be increasing as much during your activity. Um, some people even use sleep mode when they exercise with control IQ, uh, because remember during sleep mode, it's not going to give you any boluses, it'll just adjust your basal rates. Uh, so some people have found that beneficial as well too. So again, I think we're going to learn more strategies uh, in dealing with closed loop pumps as we move forward. But a lot of it is going to be trial and error, uh, truly. So we spent a lot of time talking about nutrition and insulin adjustments, which can reduce the risk of hypoglycemia following exercise. But for thoroughness, uh, I wanted to mention this uh, study back from 2006, uh, 2006 from Vasa and colleagues. So uh, in this study, seven male subjects with type 1 diabetes uh, took their normal amounts of insulin, ate their usual breakfast, and then when their postprandial blood glucose fell was 200 or less, they would have them get on an exercise back, bike, bike for 20 minutes, and then as soon as the ride was over, they either let them rest or uh, they would have them do a 10, uh, a 10 second sprint all they could go. So not a light sprint, just truly giving you all they had. Um, and what they showed was that those that rested, their blood sugars continued to decline over time, where those that uh, did the sprint kind of stable off their blood sugars and they stayed stable for approximately two hours. Uh, and I thought it was interesting here, they used millimoles per liter, but they're, at the end of two hours, those that did rest, blood sugars dropped to about 69 milligrams per deciliter, where those that didn't kind of just stayed, you know, in the hundreds. So they postulated that uh, as a way to prevent hypoglycemia, we should encourage all participants uh, who are engaging in aerobic act uh, activity to do an all out 10 second sprint uh, at the end of their exercise, um, again, to kind of prevent hypoglycemia. And uh, when I was in North Carolina, I took care of a family, and dad was military, and he shared me one time that in the military, he was taught that if he starts to go low, instead of eating, go do sprints, that the sprints will correct your blood sugar. And I remember thinking, oh, this is crazy, why don't you just eat, man? Uh, but, uh, but, I mean, there's literature out there that shows these counter-regulatory hormones when you are truly doing anabolic uh, exercise work well uh, and can stave off hypoglycemia uh, as well. As we've continued to have more technology at the market, you know, CGMs, we know that there's a lag time between, you know, your serum glucose and your interstitial glucose. But the arrow trends, I think, really can be beneficial for those participating in sport and activity. Um, so this was from a paper in 2020 by Mosser and Associates, who was just encouraging people to really pay attention to their, their arrows, uh, as it felt like that it could offer good guidance on what to do. Excuse me. So basically, he was saying, if your blood sugars are high and you're having large ketones, you're not participating in exercise. But if your blood sugars are high and you have, you know, moderate or less ketones, he felt like it was safe to participate depending on what your, your arrows are doing. If your arrows are going double up and you're still running over 250, consider giving yourself a, a bolus of, of insulin. Um, but if you have double arrows down, just go exercise and don't worry about uh, taking insulin. Um, you know, he kind of broke it into aerobic exercise versus all exercise. You know, I would, you know, make the argument if um, if you're still steady, 250 or higher, and you're going to go do intense anaerobic exercise, you may even want to consider taking a small bullet of insulin, knowing that that could potentially make your blood sugars go uh, a little bit higher. Um, and then basically he's saying, you know, if you're less than 90, you don't exercise. If your blood sugar is between 90 and 125, if you got a down arrow down, don't exercise. Go eat carbohydrates. You got double arrows up. Probably can start exercise, but if you want to eat just a, a small stack, five grams, you're probably okay to do that as well. 
So again, just kind of knowing what your blood sugar is and where your trend is heading can offer you a lot of advice of do you want to eat, do you not want to eat, insulin versus no insulin. So as Dr. Winnegar has mentioned, you know, we do have kind of a specialty clinic within our pediatric clinic, uh, just the Wendy Novak uh, Diabetes Center, the, uh, particularly the Christensen Family Sport and Activity Clinic, uh, where we try to uh, work with families uh, and patients living with, with type 1 to help improve their time and range, less hypoglycemia before or during and after the events, uh, try to help them overall improve their performance and just kind of live life to their fullest. So we've kind of used these studies to kind of come up with our our own guidelines that we give to patients. And I'll say that the, our biggest discrepancy between the Riddle studies and the other ones that we've looked at was kind of our starting blood glucose for our kids. So we encourage all of our kids to be 150 or higher starting out with. Now this is truly trial and error. We might learn that the kid not, might need to be closer to 90, but when we're learning the child, we try to set a little bit of a higher target just because we know that the effects, of especially the aerobic exercise can make them go low. So we've set a little bit higher, again, it's 150. But we, you know, uh, again, we've done the same reductions with the mealtime insulin that Riddle proposed that Dr. back in 2001 that was proposed by the first group of the 25 to 50% and the 75% reductions. You know, if you're having large ketones, you don't need to be exercising because you're at risk for dehydration and worsening uh, of your hyperglycemia. But um, if we're less than that, we're probably safe to go through as long as we're willing to monitor our blood sugars uh, over time. When it comes to the basal rates, you know, we typically, again, advise our patients, kind of like the papers we saw they did 90 minutes, we typically chose 60 minutes uh, for families because a lot of times families are on the go and typically they have about an hour before they're trying to get somewhere. Uh, so we'll reduce their basal rates, you know, depending on what activity they're doing, anywhere from 50 to 80%. Uh, and then a lot of times if they've done a lot of serious aerobic exercise, we'll keep that basal rate reduction going for 25% for sometimes six hours or more uh, after the event to try to prevent lows. We have more and more kids going to the hybrid closed loop system. So we recommend, kind of like in the study you saw from 2020, that um, we turn on exercise mode at least an hour before the event and continue it for two hours. Some people might need three, some people might need one. Again, these are just kind of starting points uh, to try, because again, a lot of this is just trial and error within the, the patients. And then before activity, again, we're having them check their blood sugars, uh, monitor ketones if they need to, less than 150, we're telling them, you know, let's, let's eat a snack. And then once they start the activity, we encourage them to monitor their blood sugar at least every 30 minutes if they're going to be uh, participating for an hour or more. And if their blood glucose is less than 150, we encourage them to eat a snack at that 30 minute mark. Or if their blood sugar drops by 100 milligrams per deciliter from the start of that time to that 30 minutes, to, to eat a 15 gram carb snack as well to hopefully prevent hypoglycemia. And then after exercise, like I said, if they're on a pump, uh, we encourage them to run that basal insulin reduction uh, for 25% up to six hours. And this can vary from person to person or if they're in the closed loop mode to keep that going for at least two. And then we also encourage them to eat healthy whole foods to replenish their glycogen stores um, so they can keep performance uh, performing at their, their highest level. And my friends, that is all I have. This is today's CME code, the 1281590. And I will take questions at this time. We're kind of right on time. That's good. Perfect. All right, so it looks like there's one in the chat. Let me read this. Oh, sorry. That was today's CME code. Yes, please. I think you could, yes. I would say if you're on insulin, if you're an insulin dependent uh, person that would you could definitely take these recommendations as well. Hydration is an always bother. Exercise is great. I would assume that with the type 2, you're only on insulin. 
For a type one, you get. No, no, for for a type two. Oh, I see your point. Yeah. 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 Um, something else on top of this. You're right, and y'all's world is very different than my world because yeah. we see way more type ones than we do type twos. Mm -hmm. You know, we only have really two medications approved for type twos: metformin and GLP one uh, agonist. So, um, so no, that's I mean, I think you, you definitely probably still could make reductions, but there might be more effect you might see. Yeah, I, mean, I haven't seen any studies in this, especially with the SUV2 inhibitors, as to whether that would be a factor. Whether that goes further. Right, to break it down slower. But are there any studies looking at that? I'll say I didn't come across any mm -hmm. this time going through at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm unaware. I can, I'll definitely go through and look mm -hmm. to see. I know, you know, with the dual pumps, I know there's a lot of social metronic type talking about using dye. Right. a way to kind of keep everything level, mm -hmm. but I did not see anything when I was preparing for this one. Yeah, you're right, you just infuse a little glucagon mm -hmm. all the time, how would that help regulate it out as well? I just find it interesting that just, you know, anaerobic exercise can have such an impact on either leveling it out, because, you know, again, I'll go back so to So you instruct them, of what do you, you know, them as what is mild moderate. Oh, that's a good one. So, you know, mild we say is kind of like just going on a walk, you know, mm -hmm. just walking around, you're playing outside, something of that nature. Moderate is more of, you know, you're jogging, you're biking, you're trying to run around with, you know, can keep up with the other, you know, kid. And then the intense is more of that game day with how you're on the basketball court, you're just running back and forth, getting a few breaks, soccer field, going back and forth. Because one of the things that we see is because people are so sedentary, uh, you know, yeah, uh, we see that all the time at Frazier because we see people coming in with a stroke or some other thing, and then these people put them into exercise, and that's the first exercise they've ever done in yeah. 15 years, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they drop, they drop yeah. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have really cut back on their insulin, you know, they're on a lot of insulin. And them to exercise twice a day, right? And uh, you're right, right. <laughs> even though the amount of activity is not that, yeah, no, it's the same. It's just our bodies, just, we want exercise, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, as a nation, like as a people, just across the board, it would all be just healthier diabetes or not. Just they like, that's what we know. Every individual is different because. Mm -hmm. Exercise and then one 12 year old male is going to be very different than another 12 year old male that are kind of very similar and know our profiles. The body's just kind of, again, all the different variables there because Johnny's cortisol levels is different than Billy's cortisol levels on game day. It's just those variables are so. I think that has been one of the problems in putting this into the pump algorithm. Because with meals, they're always using insulin carb ratios. Right. You know, but as here we don't have even that. Even though insulin carb itself can be criticized for lack of accuracy, but here we don't even have that much. You yeah. know, we're broadly categorizing them as mild, moderate, and intense. That's true, and you're you're right. That's a good point. Yeah, and it can change, right? I mean, you can get into it. And you're like, I'm going to go longer and uh, faster and further, and then all of a sudden, more things on board, and here we go, right? But about like a situation where a patient gets involved like in contact exercise, where probably they cannot do that. They can't be on the insulin pump? Yeah, like contact exercise, like a physical contact, some things. Okay, to be on the insulin pump. So a lot of times we'll just have them like disconnect, like if they're doing football or, or something of that nature, they'll just disconnect and then we'll ask them to just monitor their blood sugars every 30 minutes to, to see how they're doing. If they're having a significant rise, you know, maybe do just a, a little whiff uh, of a, a bolus, uh, and then if they're decreasing heat, but you know, so a lot of times their activity is not lasting more than an hour, hour and a half, and as long as we're going to monitor their blood sugars, you know, they're safe. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
stop sharing. Oh, I'm so sorry. There is uh, there are some questions, I believe. Okay.